the JP Morgan Summit and uh, I think one of the most interesting and exciting interviews, at least one that I have been looking forward to, is with Anu Ayangar. Anu Ayangar is of course the global head of advisory and M&A at JP Morgan, the first woman to hold that position, the first woman of colour. Uh, features on a lot of lists of the most important women in finance, etc. And has a great story of her journey from uh, India to the top of the heap when it comes to global finance. So Anu, with that introduction, <laughs> great to speak with you. I hope I you. can live up to that. Yeah, and, and coincidentally, we're wearing the exact same shape. <laughs> yes. So we're set up for a superb interview. <laughs> look, look forward to the conversation. Yeah, so let's start with where we are at this moment in time from an India perspective. And I think one of the things our viewers would want to know is your view on what we're doing right now. Um, the m and space is hot. Um, I would say the frenzy with which we're raising money or Indian companies are raising money is huge. Mm -hmm. What is the one word description for what's happening in India? Overvalued, overheated or just beginning? I'd say one word is bullish on India. Um, that's kind of our outlook. That's one of the reasons you see several people from JP Morgan who are here. And I just think there's no substitute to actually coming here and meeting clients and talking to them directly and getting the feel of the place because there's a lot that you can read and try and get a sense of. And when you look at what is going on in India at this point of time, if you ask like, why are we bullish, right? Mm -hmm. Is you have multiple things that is happening. One, the domestic consumption and India for India is a big growth driver in a way that we haven't seen in the past. Second, the exports has also become a big uh, category. Historically, we talked about services as the driver, and now manufacturing has become a big part of what is going on. And in the M&A world, we think about it as strategics and sponsors, mm. domestic and from outside the country. So if you speak about each one of these categories, right, the financial sponsor community, many of whom are international financial sponsors are over allocating to India compared to how they have done in the past. Likewise, the international companies who are in India are looking to see how do I list, because you talked about the capital raising, how do I list my company partially and create a acquisition currency that you can use at the valuation levels that are there. And likewise, domestic companies, for the first time, when we run sell-side processes, we see that domestic companies are showing up as buyers. Because when you yourself are trading at 30 times or 35 times, you have the confidence to buy something at 20 times or 25 times, which is a very different psyche. Oh, so, so very exciting. I'm wondering if there is a twinge of, is this a bit of a frenzy at all? Or are we yeah. just starting out on that journey? No, I think there is a uh, there is a question as to, and you have to go company by company as opposed to for the overall market. Sure. For companies, I think there anybody looking at, to invest in the company or buy the company will look at is the valuation justified by the fundamentals. Mm. What is the growth of the company? What can I forecast? What is the risk? What is the downside? Who's the competition? Do they what capital structure do they have? And the conclusion could be for some companies, this doesn't make sense. And for some, that this is actually a good buy. So I wouldn't say one answer for every company, but your question is very valid because you would double click when a company's valuation has gone up materially in a short period of time. Any responsible buyer should double click and say, is this valuation justified? Okay, so that's, that's uh, I think a little bit of a careful answer <laughs> to a specific question. I get it that it's company-wise, it's spe yeah. in specific terms. I'm not asking you to broad brush the whole thing. My, my question is that more often than not, is there a case to now, in your words, double click? Because a lot of the excitement is being boosted by the huge number of domestic flows coming in. The Indian retail investor is now participating. That's why the Friends Eater list, for example. It's also pushed on the kind of projections for Indian consumption. Uh, what are you looking at very, very carefully when you double click and see valuations? What are the factors that you need to see that this is a fundamental story and are you finding them enough in the Indian context? Yeah, so I'd say there are some risks we didn't talk about, right? Mm -hmm. I think some of the risks are the things that may not even be company specific. 
because if you look at what is one of the big risks to overall valuations in the world, it's geopolitical risk, yeah. which is one of the hardest to kind of put your arms around. Some of the other risks you can say is in your, you know, um, in, in, in your uh, back view mirror, right? Because you see, you know, through elections, you yeah. kind of know what the policies and things are going to be for the next four or five years. Hmm. So you have clarity on that and you have more predictability on the course that a, this economy can take for the next four or five years. So I think that's what gives you confidence. And the things that you double click on is is the current valuation of the company justified by the performance of the company? Mm. And in some cases, your answer may be no, it's not, yeah. right? Because for some other reason, maybe the company is in a particular space, maybe there is you know, a lot of retail interest in that company, but then you look at some other statistics that the, despite the amount of money that has flown into the SIPs, as a percentage of savings of households, how much money is there in the equity market? Hmm. India still lags most of the economies in the Western world. So it's, it's kind of a little bit of, you know, yes, for India, it looks like there is a dramatic flow of retail uh, fund flow into the market. And again, the market took a long time to go from trillion to two trillion, and now it's north of five trillion. So uh, I think it's a human nature to kind of look at that and say, wait a minute, how did it go up this fast, this quick? I should really spend time analyzing it. But then you look at every part of the world, what is the growth that you see? The growth that you see in this economy is still higher than almost any other market that you can invest in. Mm. The number of companies that is available for you to invest is also a lot higher than any other equity market that you can invest in. And the institutional support that is there also seems to be higher than most of the markets at this point of time. Let's talk a bit about spaces. When you're looking at global companies looking to invest in India, and in that context, um, typically I think um, maybe your whole startup frenzy in the tech space, is it still at that same level of interest? Have the sectors of interest changed? And are a lot of them also aligning to what policy push is? For example, the govern, government's push on make in India. Mm -hmm. We want to make chips here. We want to uh, make APIs here. We want to be self-sufficient because of a lot of lessons post-pandemic. Is um, global interest also sinking and dovetailing into this idea? Yeah, I think that's a very valid question. And your colleague was asking me earlier about what is the question that I have gotten the most at this conference? And that is a bit of it, is how is the external world mm. looking at India and which sectors? And you're exactly right. I think the sectors have changed a bit. Mm. I think there is uh, more interest in digital infrastructure, more interest in energy transition. And that may be because those are the things that also the policy here is uh, pushing, but it's much wider than just tech services which is maybe where things started 10 years ago, whereas today it is a much broader level of uh, interest in India. And I'd say that when you look at it from Europe, um, especially where growth is constrained in almost any part of Europe, mm. and you're looking outward, the valuation is as much a challenge in the United States because the US valuations are higher than the European valuations, and you look in Asia, primarily at two markets, Japan and India. Okay, so so India ranks, you would say, in the top two in terms of interest? In Asia, yes. Yeah. You've been obviously observing uh, what the actual nuts and bolts of acquisition in India look like. Do you think that the regulatory cholesterol has gone down? Has it become easier? Have things changed? Or are those concerns mm -hmm. still there in terms of just process? Yeah, so I think it's it's a little bit better but I think it is still there because if you want to buy a listed company mm. in India and buy it 100%, it's still not as a straightforward path as, let's say, buying a company in the UK where you have the takeover code and the rules around what you do and how you do it is so clear and is so well established and there is such a long track record of it. So certainly if you compare to a market like the US or the UK in terms of the ease the precedence and the rule book 
on um, buying a public company, uh, it, it, is, it is very different because it's a less trafficked path. And I think the rules are still evolving. For private companies, it's a totally different dynamic. Mm. And that's where you see much more of the deal activity in India is in the private markets yeah. rather than in the public markets. The public market um, activity has been much more the other way is uh, MNCs listing, mm. partially listing their company in the US. That is where you've seen the public market activity as opposed to cross-border buying an India target. What is the kind of private company activity you think you would see in India in this year, in the next few years? Is, is there sort of a projection in mind that you're looking at? So I think it's much more the sectors yeah. that we look at. Is, um, and of course, even though it's not the only sector, I think tech services, healthcare services, biopharma, all of those sectors continue to be there. And in addition, you would add uh, infrastructure, every type of infrastructure. That's a growth, growth area as well as energy transition. Yeah. Anu, I want to spend uh, a few minutes just talking a bit about you, if that's okay. <laughs> Simply because, you know, your, your journey is very inspirational to a lot of people who would be watching this interview. Uh, it's the typical Indian dream, right? You go to, you get to a, a school in America, you mm -hmm. go on a scholarship, and then you just get to the top of that chain. Is it as simple as that? Is that no. making it sound? <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> it's the 10-second version of your life. <laughs> yeah, it may appear that way, but I think nothing in life is ever a straight line yeah. uh, but, like but that. But I'll tell you what, something specific. I was looking at one of the previous interviews you did, and at one point you mm -hmm. toyed with the idea of joining civil services in India. I did. Uh, so, so now I'm imagining Anu Ayangar as an IS <laughs> officer versus global M&A chief of J.P. Morgan. Uh, there's lots of similarities actually in terms yeah. of running, a, uh, I guess, a part of a country and running a business. My father was an IS officer, and so I got to see it uh, at at close quarters, uh, and I found the job pretty interesting actually in mm -hmm. terms of. Uh, because in, in that particular district or whatever it is that you're in charge of, you can really make a difference. Yeah. So in some ways, that's why I say it's similar. It's about understanding your constituents, understanding the job at hand, mobilizing the resources in order to deliver and make a difference. And mm -hmm. in some ways, that's exactly what you do when you run a business. Do you think for uh, young people right now in India, the dream all these years later has changed? Because education, higher education outside India, has been a key to success, a key to changing yeah. you know, your situation in life from the Indian perspective. I think education itself. I think even I'd say the education that I got in India before I went to college, the foundation was pretty good. Mm. Um, so I can still do math in my head faster <laughs> than most of the people I work with. And I think that <laughs> came from... Uh, being tortured to learn all sorts of multiplication tables <laughs> as a child. And so I think the foundation in education and the belief that education can change the trajectory of your life, I think that was pretty uh, important and um, critical. And I totally agree that the choices available to somebody today in India are dramatically different. Uh, I had two career choices, is engineering or medicine. That was about it. And then anything else seemed like a rebellion and a revolution. <laughs> and so today I look at that and I, I just think there's so many, um, you know, so many things that people talk about, right? Oh, you know, I want to be an influencer and I want to be a blogger. And, um, you know, it's... it's uh, I think Middle the, class Indian parents are still rolling their eyes at that. Um, <laughs> maybe. But I think for, uh, for somebody coming out of high school, the various paths and careers that you can choose are so vast. I think it's really exciting to see. I found that very restrictive that you had to think about, oh, you know, you have to study science and you have to, you know, pick one of engineering or medical and pick one of those tracks. And that was for me the attraction of going to a liberal arts college where you didn't know what it is that you wanted to do and you went there just to study and broaden your mind. <coughs> It sounded like an uh, indulgence um, to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just one last word. Uh, I mean, your message for anyone watching this at the start of their career or finishing high school and, you know, wanting to make it big. Is that the path they need to follow today or you know, what would be your message for them? I'd say whatever it is that uh, you do, I think, um, and I say this to a lot of the interns who start with us also, 
is um, opportunity is abundant and you don't have to find the absolute perfect thing because you can pivot in life. But whatever it is that you do, uh, I'd be prepared for it. So whatever you're showing up for, do some prep work before it. Be present, because I think in today's world, the number of distractions are so high. Yeah. And the tendency to multitask is such that you don't really get what you want out of whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, and speak up. All right. We definitely have had a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anu. Pleasure to speak with you. It's likewise. Pleasure is mine. Thank you.